welcome to Light Talk. This is Stan, and we're broadcasting from LDI. LDI! LDI! <laughs> Hi, this is Steve, also coming from Las Vegas. This is Ann. And this is David, and we are the Lumen Brothers! And sister, sister. I keep telling them. <laughs> is this thing on? <laughs> I don't think it's on. And here we are, once again, broadcasting live from LDI. And some of you were here at LDI last year. How many people were here last year? Oh, oh my God. Return engagements. <laughs> so you're going to have to teach everyone else how to behave during this uh, thing. Uh, <laughs> we have, over this year, we've obviously grown a bit. We have over 60,000 downloads. Listeners in over what? 67 countries? 62. Crazy. I don't know. 64. And we lost <laughs> countries. I thought it was 72. but No, 67. I it was 67. Oh, anyway, yeah. we have a larger room. Yay. Better lighting. <laughs> we have great light. We are it's elevated on stage. That's pretty amazing, That's right? Great. We have these really cool light talk ha caps, right? We have this stupid banner, right? And you know that you made it when you get some hats and a banner, so there you go. And a sticker. And a sticker. Yeah, stickers are in the back. <laughs> All right, this is our first podcast with the four of us in the same room. Normally we do this show um, on conference software and we're all wearing our jammies probably, but we never see each other in the same room. So here we are. Um, Stan's normally in Florida, Steve's normally in Texas, David and I are SoCal living the totally. good life. We are living the yep. good life. So today the Lumen Brothers and sister are once again broadcasting from Live Design International Conference in Las Vegas, Nevada. Woo! And we're, we're locked in a room. The doors will be locked. <laughs> They'll be chained because we don't want anyone to leave over the next uh, 45 minutes. And we're here with you guys. It looks like there are about 70 of you here, maybe? 10,000. There's 10,000. 10, 10, For the people on the radio, the biggest 10, crowds. 000. The biggest crowds. <laughs> Stan is and channeling. The, and we have the best words. <laughs> we have the best words, and I know everything. Um, so anyway, we're here for about 45 minutes to talk about anything that has to do with lighting, um, design, and education, and to see if you guys can stump the chumps. So we have passed out cards to our live audience so that they can write down questions to discuss various topics. We've chosen eight questions from these cards. I think Anne did the choosing. Uh-oh, uh, don't blame me. <laughs> and we'll ask people who, from the audience who asked the questions to step up to the mic. And, yeah, just and to acknowledge the, acknowledge the question. That it's your question. Because so we may ask them questions Yeah, after. it may become a dialogue. Right, exactly. so, so. And the exciting thing is, each person who asks a question will get this special limited edition Light Talk baseball hat. Woo! Yes. There you go. Light okay. Talk hat. Your colleagues will be so jealous when you look this silly at a focus call. <laughs> <laughs> so because you are Light Talk fans, some of you followed instructions and some of you didn't. So some of you wrote your name on the piece of paper, and we know who to give a baseball cap to. So if we do one of your questions and don't acknowledge you, we want to know who you are so we can give the baseball cap out. So, David, I think you have some questions there. Oh. Who, who, who do you want to start with? Uh, oh, this is for me. Um, the oh, question is special. Yeah, special. <laughs> oh, special. We, we don't have the gray light. I know. Look out. Commercial. It's, uh, question. Um, it's for me. How do you approach and design a show that has already been mounted? I know the person who asked this question. It's Terry. Terry. Terry Harper there. Everybody say hi to Terry. Yeah, Terry. Yeah, you got to get up now and, and, and earn your abuse also. Yeah, so there's no mic. Yeah, where's the mic? Oh, we don't have a mic. Well, you already asked the question. Right? Oh, I already asked the question. Yeah, That's so right. Don't need Terry Harper. Okay. You just get your awesome hat. That's All right. So <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, how do you come in for another designer? And this does happen. It doesn't happen very frequently, but it does. First of all, I try not to watch the show the way it was done originally, uh, but sometimes that's the only record of doing it. But we actually talked about this on a previous episode about research, didn't we, Stan? Yeah, but that was sort of doing, re that was sort of looking at a finished production. Is that what this a means? Different production, yes. Yes, yeah. but, but this is relighting uh, production. This is, this is when show it's doctor been, stuff, been right? Been done show and you're a new designer yeah. on exactly. the same production. Have you ever done That's show doctor? I have not been a show doctor, but I've worked with many people that were a show doctor. That's the term of, you know, the lighting designer before you either gets fired or n demoted, essentially, and you get hired in. And um, really the key that I've learned from the people that I've worked for that do this a fair amount, because I've worked for some heavy hitters that do this, and they, uh, they always say, don't fire the lighting designer. Like the best thing to do is think of it like an educational situation. So keep the lighting designer there, even though it's a little awkward at first, have a conversation like, look, I know this is weird, but I'm here to help, so let's look at what's going on. 
you know, and then you evaluate the show and you can work with that person and say, I think what the director's seeing is you're missing some backlight that would cut them out of the background and, you know, things like that. So you're actually making a what could be a negative situation into a more positive one and you're helping that person become a, a not I don't want to say a better lighting designer but they're communicate you're understanding the director and kind of communicating with that person a little further so I think that's a good way to handle it yeah and I just want to clarify something this may not be the case in this particular situation there are some times when a designer has another gig that they're doing or for some reason they have quit the production sometimes you bring someone in and um, you're, you're lighting, I don't know, you're lighting a concert. And right. today, today uh, concert designers are much better than they were when I was starting out. But it wouldn't be unusual to bring in a concert designer to do the concert and then someone to come in, uh, uh, like Bill Klages, uh to help them make that move to television and get it looking right on camera. You might have someone else who's coming in just worrying about audience. So, you know, how many designers are on the Olympics doing different aspects of it and still coming together as one big giant thing? But Anne is right. The people I know who've come in as, as show doctors have always come in very quietly and said, do not fire the lighting designer, do not put my name anywhere in the program. I'm simply here to help with a specific problem. And then they're out the door again. Mm -hmm. Right. I'd like that gig. Go in and out the door quietly. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of one that's not theater related that I'm doing this month in fact I'm asked to light some artwork and I'm trying to get the information from the curator and I don't really have my head around what I'm going to be facing so I'm not this person lights this there's another designer who lights for this person all over the all the residences so I said maybe I should talk to the person who does this normally because I'm the pinch hitter in this case and it was and th then the curator connected us and now I'm having this conversation with this designer who is a name that I know who's New York based and I'm stepping into his work so how am I going to negotiate that so initially it's, it's like it's about respect it's about helping it's about you know not trying to it's sort of walking delicately and mm -hmm. being a good diplomat and being respectful of the other person yeah and I, it's very interesting you brought that up Stan because sometimes you do come in that way and then you have to make the decision are you following the design according to the original designer's style? Yeah. Something I used to do for um, Ken Billington, who was just in the room the other side, yeah. but also for, <laughs> uh, for Gilbert Hemsley a lot, I, and, and also Neil Jampolis. I'd go out as an assistant and actually recreate the lighting in that original designer's style. So yeah, I guess there's a lot of gray area here, depending mm -hmm. on what, what the job is. Since you mentioned style, I don't, this is, this is artwork, and I'm sure, I, I have a taste and how I might focus, how I might organize, how I might uh, arrange lenses, but I don't know what this client's taste is. So the only way I'm gonna really find out is from the guy who's been doing it for the last five years and mm -hmm. say, give me some insight. I, when he said, what do you wanna know? I said, well, what do I have to work with there on site? Because you know the inventory. And, and what wisdom can you offer me about satisfying this client? Great, Great. time for the next question. Absolutely. It's a really hard one. Uh, who Stan gets Stan this No, I don't want the hard it's ones. A, it's a, it's <laughs> what makes a lighting designer a good lighting designer? Who asked that question? Thank you. Come on one. up, get your uh, fancy <laughs> baseball cap. Yeah. 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 I will be yeah. very disappointed if I see this on eBay in five minutes. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even paid for them yet, so Wait, hang on. Wait, it's already up. No. <laughs> they may go up in value, they're rare. They are rare. It's only 12 in the world. But they're getting rarer, too. Right. The good one. Oh, man, Steve, you go. <laughs> I think what makes a good lighting designer is someone who loves their work. It doesn't matter if they are working in a community theater or if they're working on Broadway or they're doing the latest Iron Man movie. I think if you have a passion for your work and you bring that passion in, I think if you're a decent human being, uh, I think that's what makes a good lighting designer. Uh, we grow as artists, things that we were proud of 10 years ago. We're still kind of proud of it, but we also look at it and go, wow, what was I thinking there? I think every day we become better lighting designers. We become better lighting designers by going to training classes downstairs. We become better lighting designers by being social and talking to each other and listening to each other, realizing we're on a, a, you know, a journey together. I, I really believe, I, I, sincerely, I sincerely believe this, I believe that I am in a loving industry. I think uh, most of you look around USITT or SETC or LDI, you pick it, 
and you see friends that you have known a lifetime. And the industry is very small, and someone works for high end one day, and next week they work for Phillips, and the week after that they go to Robe. I, I think we're in an industry in which people know each other and care for each other and are interested in an art form that, you know, we're a tiny little industry also. We're very small when you think about the, the big world of what's going on out there. So I'm, I'm all for passion for your work. It doesn't matter what level you're working on. It is coming to the theater every day and believing in the director and believing in the cast and believing what you're doing is the very best thing on the planet. And if you've got six lights, then be happy with those six lights. And if you're out there lighting Madonna, be happy lighting Madonna. That's what makes a good lighting designer. I knew you'd have a good answer. <laughs> I, have, I, have a, I have something I can add to that brilliant answer. I, I was thinking about the fact that we all contribute to a whole. We're all contributors in this process. And so what is the measure to determine if you are a good contributor to the creative work? And I have this just one short line for you. If you can say that you left the show better than you found it, it's going to start at a certain place when you walk in the theater, and it's going to be at another place when the audience comes. And if it has improved and you've, you've added to that, then I think you're good. It's probably a spectrum of what good is in terms of, you know, but in terms of if you, if you leave anything on earth better than you found it, you did good. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I was going to say what's interesting about this question is it's not what is a good lighting design. Right. right. It's what right. is a good lighting design. designer. Right. So if we were talking about what a good lighting design is, that might be things like sculpting. That might be things about a sense of timing, you know, capturing the mood, like focus, you know, all that stuff we're always trying to do with lighting design. But I think a lighting, a good lighting designer has to do with the person in the room, kind of what you were just saying. Are you good in the room? So that means are you a good... Um, diplomat, uh, therapist, whatever you have to be that day to make tech move forward in a positive, loving, amazing, wonderful way where people enjoy their days, they love going to work even if it's 16 hours, that means that you're good in the room and to me that's a good lighting designer. Yeah, I'm going to add one more thing. <laughs> Are you a good team player? Mm -hmm. It's all about the team and that includes everybody, technicians, actors, designers, directors, everybody. Um, and also something that all the students that I spoke to just a few minutes ago in the other room, are you a problem solver? And that's just being a good theater person, not necessarily a lighting designer, but being a good theater person because we're all there helping each other and we're solving problems. And the great lighting designers, I've seen a lot of very successful lighting designers. You may not think that they're the greatest artists in the world, but they always solve problems. And when you're there, you know, during text, or doing run through, something happens, guess where it all happens? Right around the tech table, right? Right around the production table. And you're there, you're, it's a super high pressure moment, and you gotta think quickly and you gotta solve the problem. These are great answers. We should <laughs> hey, do this we've more done often. this before, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How about once a week? <laughs> well, we can do it once a week, sure. All right, I'll ask one. Um, how major of a role do you see visualization tools playing? What growth do you predict within this technology? Who asked that question? Hey, Come on, yeah, here, grab a hat. Yeah, there we go. Huge. It's huge. It's a huge hat. It's a huge, no, it's a huge <laughs> ish. Good catch. Yeah. Can I see that question? Yeah. I want to, I want to oh, you want to grab it? I like this question. <laughs> well, I'll just add quickly yeah. then. Um, I think visualization software is going somewhere. <laughs> and that is not an answer. But... I, I think that more and more where its place is is that producers are not paying for money for time in the theater because it's so expensive. So I'm seeing more and more designers visualizing their work before they get in the theater. That's hurting us a little bit because we're not always getting paid for that time, that prep time. Plus, I find we've become sort of more of our own programmers, which is also problematic in many other reasons, in many other ways. Um, but I think visualization is here to stay and only going to become more and more because we need to pr problem solve this time crunch issue where the producers aren't paying for us to be in the theater. And at that, the same time, shows are getting more and more and more complex. Audiences and young directors are expecting more and more and more. So I think there's the only answer is trying to do our homework ahead of time and not just walking in the theater with a blank slate the first day. Well, also, Anne, uh, I mean, if you think about it in the corporate world, you have someone like Paul Mitchell 
uh, and I have a room full of uh, account executives, no one in that room is going to let me say, let me show you at tech what it's going to look like. Right. Everybody <laughs> wants to approve and, uh, or to approve the design and sign off on it. And for, for those men and women in here who are doing rock and roll, you know um, a good day when you're in the arena, a good day is three songs in four hours. And that's, what, that's what's expected of you. And you, if with, without visualization, you're not going to be able to come in and meet the demand of the client. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is, it's it's absolutely necessary. It's like the old days when someone said uh, a computer light board, or <laughs> you're using AutoCAD, you're using pre-visualization. Of course, of course, it is the journey we're all on, and we're learning every day how to be more efficient as artists. And this is a tool that we have to have to master. I have a long history with this question because in the first time I saw a lighting visualization software, I fell in love and I think it was born out of poverty in a sense. I felt like I didn't have a way to show a director or a choreographer what my ideas were unless I had a light lab with lights and I didn't, unless I had fiber optics that I have now, I didn't, I had a flashlight and a swatch book, mm -hmm. and maybe there was a model, and I felt that that was really pretty anemic. So when I first saw visualization software, and I think they might have been the first, if I'm not gonna plug any products, but there was one company that sort of came out with this thing in, in that early 2000s, I said, I gotta get this, because I need to teach this. And- What company was it? It was Cast Software, it was WYSIWYG, and it won an, it won an Academy Award back then, because they were pre the award shows. And I said, this is, this is the best thing since sliced bread. I've been waiting, this, waiting for this forever. And I got a grant. And so I've been working with that stuff for 20 years. And not to plug them too much, but I heard today, well, we've been working for three years to make it free for academia, which it was announced on Thursday. So that's a milestone, wow. right? But using that, when I was teaching at the Cal College and I wasn't at the University of Florida, we didn't have any money, right? But I couldn't teach a student what the light was going to do. We couldn't get in the theater. They were busy building. We couldn't turn the lights off. So ha to sh turn on the light and see what it's going to do in three-dimensional space was huge. And then to get a rendering, and then to storyboard, and then to plug a board in. So I'm a big fan. I've been a big fan for a long time. Um, I think you, I teach it. I think you got to do it. Um, I can't think of a reason why you wouldn't, mm. frankly. It's, it's a fantastic tool and a time saver. And it gets your thoughts out of your head and into something where, oh, I see what that's going to do. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm curious what your favorite visualization tools are. I, I know people don't think I'm crazy. Uh, <laughs> he likes a pencil. No, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling and working my way through light converse. Yeah, um, and yeah. I, I hear these days, I've been away from it for a while, maybe someone can answer in the, I hear vision has gotten much better and is super intuitive. I was just That's what I use. thumbs up yeah. in the back. Yeah. Um, okay. Have to yeah. see it. Phillips Last time I touched it, it was not intuitive. So, I but I'm open. It's still got a ways to go, but vision is what I teach and what I use. And I've, I've, especially now that it's it, with 2019 VectorWorks, it's going to be free for education for 2019. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so I, I love it for that. You know, it sounds like the other ones are going that direction too. But I, I think it's, it's getting much better. I, I like it a lot. Yeah, I was just at the booth and I was talking to one of the engineers there and of course you know visions there's a long history you know I, I we were using vision when they were their their own program their own company right, right, right. right. AJ was was AJ. running that company right mm -hmm. and a great guy really nice person well they saw <laughs> and it was so funny because they were they sort of had this a relationship with uh, Vectorworks and even at LDI their booths were right next to each other and you know when you had to go from Vectorworks to vision, you'd have to change the symbols, you'd have to do all this weird stuff. And I would come into the booth, the, the both booths, they're right next to each other, I said, why do I have to do this? And they, they both did the, you know, pointing at each other, right? <laughs> then, they, and then a few years ago, they sold uh, vision to Vectorworks, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and things got a little better, but in that transfer, that transition, it got really clunky again. So um, just talk to them today, they've gone ahead and they're doing this new type of, um, uh, and I forgot the name of the, I think it's GD, someone help me with this, GD. GDTF? TF, right, yeah. right, right. Oh, yeah, Thank you so much. Universal. <laughs> now the acronym is, not, is actually very, very filthy dirty. <laughs> 
So you can figure out the acronym. <laughs> but it, I, I mean the acronym. But anyway. Um, I just want to interrupt. Oh, please do. My mother will be listening to this episode. <laughs> so if She'll you figure just, it out. If you want She'll to throw it in there. I'm not going to throw it in there. We'll, <laughs> we'll edit it out. But, but now that they're using it, it's basically a universal uh, language going from boards. I know the MA is using it now. By the way, the MA3 is fantastic. I just saw it. I just loved it. But anyway, they're using it. A lot of these new lighting boards are using this, and also a lot of the uh, visualization software, so that things are more accurate. If a light can't get to primary blue, it won't go to primary blue, you know, things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it looks like it's going to get there. So we'll see. And now that it's free, Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll all be able to handle it. And also WYSIWYG being free is a huge savings. It's a huge it's a, it's a, it's a, I, think, I think what I heard today was you, you, you sign up for it in, in, with ID, uh, student ID in the fall, and then if you don't get, get in by December, get, you don't subscribe by December, you only get design, you don't get live performance, and then it's 99 bucks a year for students after that. Sounds good. I want to mention one other one that I like. I haven't had. I bought the book, but I haven't had time to play with it. Is Capture, Capture. Yeah. which is also at, free out of Sweden, students. which is also pretty good. And mm -hmm. Light Converse too. I mean, they're they're all making good stuff now. Mm -hmm. So it may just be the flavor of you know the one that you like or have history with. I've got 20 years in on wig, so it's it might be not efficient for me to change at this point now that it's available for free. But they're all doing a great job. I think it's just a, a tool you have to know. Well, fortunately, Simon put his name in. Simon, and this is. What is your preferred method of communicating your design to the director before load-in? Carrier pigeon. Uh, could it be visualization? Oh, Simone. Oh, Simone. Simone. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's Simone. Simone. That's Simone. Sorry, Simone. <laughs> Give her two hats. Uh, Congratulations. Uh, do you use AutoCAD? Do you use watercolor? Uh, does it uh, vary depending on with whom you're working? She's asking for Simon is what oh, she just told Oh, so it's not Simone. <laughs> well, what's, what, what is your name? Bring that cat back. Yeah, we, <laughs> can we trust you with that cap? You're not going to sell it on eBay? Okay. Make sure it gets to Simon. There's a couple things. Um, I teach in Dallas, and I've been advocating with our students for years and years and years to use uh, visualization partly uh, to communicate their ideas to a director. It started, uh, I mean, uh, from a very simple request years ago. Uh, an opera director put a giant, like, 15-foot-high statue in the middle of his set, and we wanted to show him what that actually meant mm -hmm. and what the ramifications of having this thing dead center was. And mm -hmm. once uh, we worked through that, we, we could determine where we could put lights clearly to keep the statue dead center, but how we could work around that and enhance that environment. So, you know, I think uh, the days of saying things like, let's go look at a sunset together here, let's listen to the Beatles album, I think those days are long gone. I, I spend a lot of time with the director in rehearsal. Uh, I ask them uh, what they're trying to achieve, what we're trying to go, what is, what is the direction we're taking. I, I don't show them images much. Uh, the, the bulk of my work has been in Europe. So I have always, I've always had that tradition of sitting in the rehearsal with the director, with these crazy Eastern European directors who walk into the first day of rehearsal and say, I need a chair. And here comes the state theater people and they put a chair. And he or she says, that's the wrong chair, let's find another chair. But they work through this a very slow, methodical way until they get everything really what, as they want it on stage. Um, I've always had the, uh, the, the kind of uh, blessed life that lighting starts early in the rehearsal process, which is not what we do because of money restrictions in the theater. So I'm a, I mean, I become kind of a member of the acting company in a way, working through the process for weeks and weeks and weeks. Now, the reality when I'm working in the States it is, it is, as you know, it's every man and woman for himself. You have to work as fast as you can. You have to put up uh, the most flexible rig you can. As you well know, there are a lot of theaters that, uh, that want your light plot before the first read-through of the show. So you try to cover yourself as best as you can, and you make it as flexible as you can. Uh, my plots these days are, are huge moving light plots, but that allows me to have the flexibility so when I get into the theater, I can make those choices with the director as opposed to saying, oops, I put the light in the wrong place because you've now decided to do something stage left. 
and it's actually better stage left than it was stage right. So technology, in many ways, has made my life much easier working in the theater. So for me, it is one-on-one -on -one with that person in the rehearsal hall, at dinner, maybe I am taking long walks with them, talking about the show and what we're trying to do. Well, it's, I guess it depends on the director. Um, you know, if it's a director I've worked with for a long time and now I'm at a point in my career where it's, it's rare, well, it's fairly uncommon that I um, work with new directors, uh, that we already speak a visual language and we speak an emotion. And uh, my lighting is usually very expressionistic um, and uh, very stylized, not always, but most of the time, you know, depending again on the director. So there's very little actual visualization that I show the director, unless it's a special uh, moment that we're going to be working on or a special sequence of cues. I knew on Ruzalka when I was doing that in uh, Oslo, uh, even though I'd worked with this director forever, there were so many special effects in the show and I was also designing lighting and, uh, and projections and it was a big video show that I had to do a lot of video previs on it, uh, which was good. It helped me, it helped him. You know, we, we got to decide on content. Uh, you're more like a scenic designer at that point anyway, but still lighting had a lot to do with, obviously, with projections. Uh, if it's a new director, again, depending on the show and how open the director, and if the, and if the director has, speaks the language that I speak, but maybe not, then I do use some previs. I, you know, I will show the major looks, but understanding that I treat lighting a show sort of like jazz. Um, I'm a jazz player and, you know, you may start somewhere, but that show's going to move, you know? That show's going to evolve, which is why I love lighting so much. I think probably speaking for most people in this room is that you're able to really move that show with the actors and the director and, and things are happening. I kind of feel bad for the set designers at that <laughs> point, you know, because there's very little you could do as a set designer. And I do a lot of set design too, so it's like, you know, God, I'm glad I'm the lighting designer, you know, right? So I guess it depends on, on, on the director. Yeah. For me, uh, research, I show research images. Um, and then I have begun doing a lot of little pencil sketches, either pencil or pen, like ballpoint pen. I'm not very fancy, it's on like printer paper. I'm definitely not fancy. So, but I like, sometimes I can't find the research image that pulls the thing out of my head and really shows it to the director. So if I'm really inspired by a moment, I do these little scribbly sketches with like stick figure-like things in it, you know, and it's, it's really basic looking, but it's, it's enough to show, you know, shadows and angle and maybe a sense of mood or some thing that I can't describe through the research images I found. When I make the research plates, I'll also put those renderings in there. So it's a, sort of an all-in-one thing when I'm talking to the director. Um, and the second part of the question was, does it matter who you're working with? And I'd say, yeah, sometimes, uh, for example, I've worked with a director once or a couple times that uh, that person did not get research. You know, I would show her something and she'd say, well, is the sky going to look like that? Is it going to be this little bright thing here? You know, that kind of thing. And when that happens, I just sort of shut the book and go, okay, well, let's talk about that scene. You know, so it just didn't work for her. And that's okay. You know, people think in different ways. Um, so I'd say normally I approach it with the research and a few little scribbly renderings that I do. And then uh, if I need to change course during the conversation, I will. You are listening to Light Talk with Steve, Stan, and David, the Lumen Brothers and Sister. And this week, Light Talk is sponsored by... Better Than Nothing Industries, and they are presenting the BS Blaster Shock Collar. <laughs> it's available downstairs at LDI right now. Whether you have a salesman with a passion for persistent verbal product enhancement or a customer you would like to train to tell the truth about what he or she can buy, you may want to consider the BS Blaster Shock Collar, AKA Electronic Collar, E-Collar, or Remote Shock Collar. As with any method of behavior modification, there are pros and cons. Ultimately, it is up to you to choose what method works best for your needs. The BS Blaster Shock Collar is not intended as punishment, but more as a deterrent to negative behavior. The theory is that your person will associate the unwanted behavior with a slightly uncomfortable zap and stop doing whatever they're doing until they no longer do it and remember not to do it anymore. The shock administrated by the BS Blaster Shock Collar is safe. 
So while it is certainly enough to get the attention and deter certain behaviors, it won't cause any lasting physical or mental harm. For example, when you walk into a booth at LDI, both customer and salesperson place their shot collars around their necks. A conversation begins with the customer saying, I'm ready to buy a hundred of those moving lights. Zap! <laughs> He's not ready to buy a hundred moving lights, and he doesn't even have the money to do it. So, the salesman assures him that he can meet delivery on that order. Zap! Because he's showing the prototype. He has no intention of making delivery on that order. So, much like the missile game in 007's Never Say Never, with each misleading answer, the shocks grow in intensity until one of you pass out. The BS <laughs> blaster shock collar can also be used at design meetings, contract negotiations, first dates. <laughs> Probably made in America by better than nothing industries. Oh God, we all oh, need wow. that. Yeah. All right, so we need one right now. <laughs> anyway, um, before we get back to the show, I, I just had a question because here we did this briefly last year. Um, I just want to ask my fellow Lumen brothers and sister. Lumen um, humans. Uh, Lumen. Wait, wait. What was the name? Union of Lumens. Lumen people. Lumen no, no, no. But we had that great name for our new. For our new oh, company. Oh, the Luminous people. The Lu the luminous, no, the Luminous, luminous, luminous group. group. Luminous. The Luminous group. <laughs> All right. My Luminous. You guys have been on the floor. Not much. I'm talking about here, not on the floor. Not right? Much. You guys have been on the floor. Not much. What one product did you see here on this floor that you liked? I do not count because I've spent this whole time at the airport. Okay. Right. <laughs> why, don't you tell, why, why don't you tell everybody about, about your experience at the airport? <laughs> Well, I live a 45-minute plane ride from here, and I spent 12 hours at the airport yesterday. Yes, because the plane had an emergency light out. We're going to LDI. How many lighting people are on this plane? <laughs> <laughs> I could change a bulb. <laughs> yes, yeah, so apparently nobody could change a lamp, right? So, yeah, they, they grounded us, and they had to get the part from LAX, which was like four hours of traffic, if you know Southern California. And then they brought back the little lamp to fix it, and then another part was broken, so they had to go back to LAX, which is oh. another part. So literally I spent 12 hours in the airport and did not see the floor, so I can't contribute. Right. And you came in last night, right? Came Late last night. Night, then you this is your third session today yes my third session today so I was on the floor for about 20 minutes but right. I cannot besides the cool uh, Roby had a cool uh, what was that thing it looked like a Buddha or something like display. oh you were in the booth uh, yeah, yeah but I didn't see their show I just walked past it and said way, oh that's neat you know by the way I've I've been going to LDI since the first year um, not every 30 years <laughs> but <laughs> probably at least 20 of them and I've never had to go to the bathroom more than this LDI and you know why? Because no. there's water everywhere. Oh. <laughs> you know, and it's something, Stan, you had mentioned in the last week's episode. You, we were asking what you want to see at LDI. You said you wanted to see more waterproof, waterproof fixtures. fixtures. Oh, yes. Well, they're all over the place. They're all over, yeah, they're, they're, everybody's doing that. They are all over the place. Can I give now. you mine? Yes. Yeah. So I haven't been on the floor much, so I haven't been to everybody's booth. But I came back to see your product a second time that was shown last year because now I want to buy it. But I can't buy it. <laughs> and it's Rosebrand's Darknet. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. Have you all seen well, that? That was from last year, yeah. It was yeah. here last year. I went out, I, I was doing a show called Rough Magic. It's the perfect solution for this production. So I said, that's 40 feet wide, okay, but by one yard, it's $1,500. So it's $12,000 for this drop. And I said, you know, who are you building this for? Who is going to buy this? And they were like, well, it's a kind of a specialty product, and there will you know, there'll be Sir. very few. And I went, Sir. yeah, there will be very few instances of this product. So, so are you sort of designing something intentionally to be so special that, you know, there will be four people, four shows in Vegas will have it, and nobody else in the world will have it, and I don't know what the thinking, the business model is there. But I did think of this. I did ask, are you doing that with, like, nanotechnology coding on it? Like, what are you doing? And she did say, well, it's a paint. It's a certain kind of paint with a game that we had designed. And I thought, hmm, 
I work at a really big university with lots of material scientists. I wonder if we could do that. A research university, right? Right. Watch out. I mean, we've got some pretty people not in the theater department, okay, who know how to do that kind of thing. So people that, who can actually think. Somebody's going right. to come get you with a dark well, but take you out of here. Well, that front is phenomenal. That it's, you know, in regular light, it's invisible. You project on it and you see the image. It's like Pepper's Ghost, a 21st century version of Pepper's Ghost. Mm. So that one for me. Um, I'm doing a project where I'm going to use ETC's new rigging product called Flypipe, which is basically a self-climber. It's a pipe with the, the motor rides on the pipe. You hook it up, up and down she goes, about 600 pounds on a 21-foot on a stick. Um, runs pow So that's going to be a nice solution for me in scenarios where we can't afford you know, automated rigging. So light pipe. And then I went to see quickly because one of my students was excited about Martin sent a thing out about the Allure. Mm -hmm. which is a, 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 a profile fixture, but each, I guess, each LED emitter, I guess, can do red, can change colors independently. I think, I think frankly, everybody who's making an LED array and a fixture, why not just give us control of the, of the emitters independently? How tough is that to do on the PCB board? I don't know. Like so that's kind of cool. It's, it's, it's a bit yeah. gimmicky. Yeah, the eyes do, yeah, yeah, in wash fixtures, but not in profiles. Right. Mm. Oh. Martin showed that last year where you can have the, the center of the beam hotter, you control the center of the beam and the outside of the beam. That takes us back to old beam and field <laughs> angle. So, you know, th that allure thing maybe is gimmicky, but I thought, hmm. Yeah, because what's know, the point of that? Situations, it'll be really, and that's all I've seen. I, I haven't been around much, and i got to go back to CAST software because they want to tell me more about the academic release, and I think that's a big piece of news. Cool. Pick me, pick me. Steve, you're I'm next. Spe I'm speaking now to my brothers and sisters who live on the road. In the back corner near GLP, there is the Cozy Roadie. Have you guys been back there? The Cozy Roadie. I'm telling you. It's one of our so, sponsors. What they have done is they have taken a really nice leather, comfy, cozy office chair. And they've taken that thing and made it into a transformer. They pull a pin, the top flips down. They have a thing at the bottom. It looks like it came off a battleship. You can pull this thing apart, put it in a road box, and travel with it. Aww. I, for one, have spent hundreds of dollars because I show up and someone says, here's your chair, and it came off the top of the rig and was broken. Aww. So it's like every three stops, I'm sending someone to Staples to buy me a chair. So the Cozy Roadie, go back and take a look at it. Husband and wife team out of Arizona. They're, they're going to make millions. Cozy Roadie. Right. That definitely sounds like one of our sponsors, so, yeah, so we does. can't steal it. Okay, and then finally, I'm just going to mention a shout out. Speaking of GLP, a shout out to them. Uh, last year, my favorite item the was Adam. GLP. No, it wasn't the Adam. It was the fan. The oh, Force yeah, 20. Fan, fan, fan. I love that. I love that. <laughs> I thought that was the fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, I'll my. use it twice. <laughs> All right, but this year they have the FP, is it? No, FR1, the FR1, which is basically an atom, which I love because they're really small. They have zoom, they have a decent zoom in it. They, they are CMY, just lovely, actually it's RGB, not CMY, right, RGB. No, I think, anyway, they come in different forms, but it's on a yoke. And it's funny because Steve was mentioning this last week about a, a birdie, a type of birdie that was automated pan birdie, pan the pan and I, tilt. I, well, I, I'm tired of, I mean, I love these lights, but I don't like a 12-inch high footlight at the front of the stage. Mm -hmm. I, I want a color-changing birdie oh, okay. size. Right. It doesn't have to be a birdie. And if it's pan and tilt, that's great. So let me, let me tell you, my I called my electrician, called my electrician, Terry, and she said, oh, I can build that for you right now, hon. You can build me a pan tilt birdie that color changes. And she goes, the pan tilt's going to be kind of hard. But I just took an unbelievable amount of, uh, of multicolor LED tape and crammed it in that birdie. She goes, you won't believe how good it looks. The output of that light, it color changes. She says, it looks like hell when you look at it from the front. But when you look at it from the audience point of view, it is gorgeous. So I, I'm, I'm trusting Don Askew, my electrician. I can't wait to get back to Dallas and see what Frankenstein thing she came up with. <laughs> uh, but let me tell you, I did mention my pan tilt birdie to high end. Oh, yeah. ah. And those guys were all sitting around the table going, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're, they're thinking about it. They're well, thinking GLP about has it. it already. Their problem is motor size. <laughs> Ganton. Oh, Gantum? Gantum, maybe. I haven't they been to have the Gantum. Oh, they don't have the I birdie, I haven't been though. to the Gantum yeah. yet, but they make the little ones. And now, back to Light Talk. <laughs> okay, our next question 
while gr and we got to do this quickly because we only have like 15 minutes left. Yep. While growing an inventory, which would you purchase next? Front light or dance boom, side light, and why? So apparently you already have backlight. But you right. don't have a light talk baseball yeah. cap. No, who is this? <laughs> Who's this? Yeah, this? questions? Oh, oh there you. we go. What's your name? What's your name? Molly. 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 Hey, Congratulations. So Molly, are you saying that you have lights already? Just yeah, looking for the. Psych lights and overheads and catwalk. Okay, so they have psych lights, psych lights, overhead and catwalk. Okay. Which would ah. you do first? Well, this is easy for me. You'd go with side light. You'd go with the booms, because you know when I do shows, I have front light, but I usually run it at about 20%, you know, 15%, 30 maybe at the most. The side light is really what's going to give you the real dynamic shaping light and, and the most theatrical and, uh, and powerful shape. I'm going to okay. second side light. That's all I got. I okay. agree. <laughs> I could give you my little biology thing about side light. <coughs> I've said it all. That's in episode 17. It's in episode okay, 17. Okay, go back to episode 17, his biology explanation. I, I, it's why we love side light. You can't help but love it. It's, it's built, a chemical reaction. It's a chemical again. reaction in your brain. It is built into your body. You can't, this is why photographers like what they call magic time, dawn and dusk. When something's lit from the side, the, should I not go into it? 10 seconds. 10 seconds. When, you're, when you get information easily, your brain gives you a dopamine response. When you get information difficultly, it's hard. So the side light gives you the edge and your brain knows what it is. Oh. And when you get the information more easily, you get a pleasure, you get a pleasure juice. That's why. Okay. And you can't take that away. That explains this, it all. Is, is that, that a technical term? Baby? Pleasure, pleasure juice. juice. You get a dopamine. Get some brain, <laughs> the brain rewards you for easy and it, and it punishes you for hard. Give me, well. <laughs> How's that? No, no. Okay, going. that's the other way around. <laughs> but but we love the juice. That's the same. Right. Okay, so there it goes. Side light juice. All right, who's next? We we live in a world full of bad lighting. Who is this? <laughs> nice. You get a hat. Yeah. Come get your hat. This is Douglas B. Sorry, it Douglas. Says. Douglas. Right. Thank you, All Douglas. Right. We live in a Douglas. world full of bad lighting. As a lighting professional, what one thing would you change? that we may all live in better lit environments. Oh, wow. <laughs> I would have everything lit by lighting designers and not by engineers. <laughs> Nothing against engineers. No. <laughs> lighting designers. Right. Wow, got applause. Yeah, engineers yeah. are brilliant and they have amazing jobs and they're brilliant, right? But they like, look at down. this room. Yeah. This is lit by an engineer. This is not lit by a lighting designer, probably. So uh, that's what I would say because you want people that are more um, sensitive to the artful side of lighting that could make everything look more beautiful and we could still reach the foot candle levels that we all need in this room. All that's all right. I'm saying. And the emotional side. We just feel better when we are beautifully lit. You know, you know what I do? I'm like, I'm the lighting Nazi at school. I go down the hallway and I look into people's offices and they have those horrible fluorescent. I said, turn those off. I'll go down to Target and buy you a $10 torchier lamp or something, but with the better color temperature, that doesn't have horrible shadows. We should have brought some good lighting for today. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm wearing a hat. Steve? Oh, no, I, I agree. I totally well, agree. It's easy. Okay. I, got, I got one on this. So this is a big conversation. Ann mentioned um, uh, illuminating engineers, right, which are out there, and they've been lighting space for a long time. But here's the critical difference, and this is a big conversation in that field. They're licensed. So in Europe, for example, there's a movement to license the lighting designer, oh. not the, the engineer. So if we wanted to have a movement, so to speak, and it's, it is, there is a bit of this movement in this country because there are, there are the International Association of Lighting Designers, which is based in the United States, and the architectural lighting designers belong, has an impetus to lobby state legislatures to license lighting designers so that all the work is not just in the hands of the engineer. They, they own that, right, politically. So if you, if you really want to make that change so that the light in this room could be functional and aesthetic, which is what Anne is getting to, we have to assert ourselves as not just people who play with lights and make pretty concerts. That, there's, no, there's no license for that. There's liability in what they do. So they are licensed and responsible. So we would have to sort of up our game and then, and then lobby for that kind of a change. That's a long-term goal. It'll probably happen after I'm gone, but I would encourage us to do that. It's raising the lighting design profession to the same level as an architect or an engineer, and we should. All right. What is that? That's my stomach. That's a subway? <laughs> That's a subway. <laughs> Steve's got the next question. Okay. 
Have you ever, I'm looking at you, Terry. Have you ever dealt with a master electrician who continuously slacks off carrying out your notes? Yeah. Who was this? All right, come okay, on. Get come on, on <laughs> Yeah, all right. <laughs> What's your name? Drew. Drew. Thanks, Thanks, Drew. Drew. Great question. And how do you resolve this issue? Um, okay, so short answer. Um, Fired. Fired. Um, I, I, get, I, I try to get rid of that master electrician. Um, boy, that, that is a tough one. It is. Um, I think it kind of depends on where you are. I think if I'm uh, traveling to a theater, uh, you know, the first, thing I, the first thing I do when I'm doing a show out of town is I contact the master electrician. I send all my paperwork uh, to he or she, and I say, let's talk. Let's talk about uh, the equipment. Uh, tell me what is your A equipment, what is your B equipment, what is your C equipment, and what am I thinking using your Klegel 1355s as a Ooh. front of house wash. So I, I try to uh, avoid uh, um, conflict with the master electrician. And sometimes conflict leads to uh, uh, people just saying, well, to hell with him, I'm going to slow down a little bit. But I want the master electrician to be on my side. I want that master electrician or that production electrician to feel like they are contributing and they are a valued team member, which they are. Uh, because I think this question could be turned around. Uh, what do you think of a lighting designer who is a continuous slacker and can't get his or her light plot to me on time or cannot seem to get a color order to me on time? Maybe I'm idealistic, but I think as you move up the food, as we move up the food chain, we find better and better and better people to work with, and they are they're confident in who they are, and they want to do a good job. I, my, my first uh, master electrician in New York, I was very young and very naive uh, when I did my first show in the city. And uh, my master electrician and my assistant was, was his wife. They were maybe 10 years older than me. Uh, and they came in and they very gently found every mistake in my light plot. They found everything that was wrong. From, from things like, you know, you've put in a lot of 12-3 cable. Do you really need that? Well, that's the cable I knew from college. And they said, what you really need here on that load is 14-3. Yeah, we could probably use some 16-2 here. Do you really want to send a shop order in that says uh, um, ellipsoidal complete? Do you even know what that means? You know, do you need a gel frame for every light? They, they gave me a really good lesson. So um, I, I followed uh, someone at SMU uh, by the name of Bill Eckhart. And Bill Eckhart was a Broadway designer for years with his wife. And the one thing that he used to say, which I really believed, is that young lighting designers should work with mature and talented master electricians. And young master electricians should work with mature and talented lighting designers. Because there's, I mean, how much do we learn by observation? How much do we learn by, you know, a, a simple kind of whisper in our ear. So I would say uh, fire him, but <laughs> if you can't fire him or her, uh, sit down, have a cup of coffee, and try to find resolution on this, because it'll just make everyone's life a whole lot better at the end of the day. Can I add something to that? Because you, you, you struck a memory. We interviewed Fred Foster last uh, summer at the ETC workshop, and I don't remember if he said it during the interview or not, but somewhere along the line he said this, a bunch of these industry veterans were sitting around talking about who their mentors were. And they had noticed that all of their mentors were 10 or more years older than they were. And they thought that that was a value because for two reasons. One, the experience that Steve mentioned, and also that they weren't competing for the same work. Right? <laughs> right. So the mentor was perfectly happy to help you move, move you along. But if you're, at this, if you're in the same generation, you're in competition. But there's, I think there's some wisdom in that, in, in, in having some generational differences in, in those positions. I, we can't control that, obviously. Well, I mean, you, you see everybody who is in the touring industry sees this every day of the week. There are 15 people on the crew who are brilliant. And there's that w one person that is just, hey, can I have a T-shirt? Um, always seems to be wandering off. So, 
you know, in that case, you can kind of be fortunate and just too bad promoters paying for him or her, uh, let's turn them loose on something that is just not going to slow us down all day long. Okay, great. We have our final question of the day. Yes. Okay. So well, we have two more hats. Two how'd more that hats. work I don't out? Know how that happens. We'll give this out to someone who comes on. One of them, Steve's? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And we'll figure it out. Well, so I don't know who asked this, so I'm going to ask it and see if we can figure out who asked it. This is what kind of things should I put on my website? Who asked that question? Hey. Come on hey. up here. Hey. All right. Hey. Okay. <laughs> what's, your, what's your name? Josh. Josh. Thank you, Josh. Have a hat. Josh is one of my proud students at SMU. Oh. Right. Okay, Josh. Oh. There you go. It was not rigged. We didn't know we were giving a hat to him. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> but if anybody wants this last hat, come see us after. Oh, man, there's you a can fight. raffle there's it off. Rush. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think on your website, pretty pictures. I just want to start there. Pretty, pretty pictures. Um, because you want to think about who your website is speaking to. And this is me thinking about lighting designers, right? If, you're, if your website is... You're hoping a director will look at your website and hire you, then they want to see pictures, they, photos. They don't want to see light plots. Right. They do not want to see light right. They don't know what a magic sheet is. So leave all that stuff off. If you're looking to be an, an assistant to a designer, so then you're thinking about your audience of your website, right? If the designer is looking to hire an assistant, then put your drafting on it, then put your paperwork, your magic sheets, all that stuff, as well as some pretty pictures, because a designer will not hire you as an assistant unless they know you have a design eye. So that really matters to have both in that place. Um, and thirdly, I'd say if you're looking to go to grad school, then have the pretty pictures and the paperwork and anything else you've done. So if you've also done props and you've also done scenery, put that on there because a grad school wants to look at sort of the breadth of your work and not just, you know, the two shows or the 12 shows you've designed. Yeah, that's, that pretty much puts it. Do you guys have anything to add? No, I would, I would say when you're showing your, your website and your portfolio and you're out there trying to get that first job, it's also really important to be social. You oh, know, yeah, if, put a picture on. If, if, no, yeah. I was going to say if mm -hmm. Steve Shelley were in the room, he would say, yes. be sure you're at opening night at some of these little off-off-Broadway houses. Find out where the local watering hole is. Let people know who you are. And that's a very important part of getting that first, first job. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, that Hammond Organcello tells us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk fun. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. So if you take us seriously and you decide to litigate, just remember that the law firm who we've rehired of Phosphor, Tungsten, and Scheister will defend us until our retirement accounts are completely empty. <laughs> Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Humans. Yeah. Coming to you from the Las Vegas Convention Center in Sin City, Las Vegas, Nevada. That's right. And be sure to tune in next week when we present our second annual ERTA special. Everything you ever wanted to know about the ERTA process with our special guest and executive director of ERTA, Tony Hagopian. <laughs> All that and a new sponsor, Light Talk broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge around the world. So we'll see you guys all next week. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.